Uh, number one, we talk about chronic inflammation and that most of us somehow think that chronic inflammation in one way or another is driving most of our chronic disease processes in one way or another. And people go, well, where does chronic inflammation come from? Uh, I think, and many others now think that chronic inflammation is actually coming from leaky gut. And if, if you had asked me, I think 15 years ago, what I thought about leaky gut, uh, I probably would have called it pseudoscience um, and said, oh, come on, really? Uh, there's, there's very little evidence. But I think uh, thanks to Alessio Fasano and others, uh, we now know that leaky gut probably confirms what Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago, that all disease begins in the gut. In fact, Dr. Fasano uh, from Harvard now has a new paper out saying all disease begins in a leaky gut. And I, th I think he's absolutely right. And certainly in our practice, uh, I see that really as the, one of the major driving forces in chronic inflammation. Now, why does that reduce energy? Because 70 to 80% of our immune system, as you know, uh, lives in our gut, lives along the lining of the gut. And the immune system is a big time energy hog, an energy burner. And we devote a huge amount of our resources to powering our immune system. And an example I use in the book, which I use with my patients uh, constantly, uh, before COVID, there was obviously the flu. And the flu is a virus like COVID. Uh, and the flu in and of itself is just a protein that our immune system looks at and says, oh my gosh, this is a bad actor. And we've got to mobilize our forces and we've got to be ready to you know, get this guy. So what we do, the flu does not cause you to be aching and have ache and pain and just want to lay in bed. Uh, the flu does not give you brain fog. Uh, the flu does not make you channel surf and not think. Your immune system actually needs all that energy. So what we do is we ration uh, energy. We make ourselves hurt. Our immune system makes ourselves hurt. So we don't move. If our muscles hurt, we don't move. And we make our brain go into standby mode because our brain is the biggest energy hog at all, of all. And if you're using 20% of your energy to think, uh, you're taking away from your immune system. And so imagine the same thing happens in our gut when we have leaky gut. A huge amount of the energy that we would normally have goes to our immune system in our gut. That's number one. So what you've been saying is quite incredible, which is that a lot of the fatigue that we think may have other causes might start in the gut, because when your gut is damaged or injured, it literally, quote, leaks the bad toxic crap literally into your immune system, and your immune system goes, ah, what's this, and I better do something about it. It's, it's very busy and sucks a lot of energy, but it also creates inflammation, and inflammation and fatigue just are, you know, neck and neck. That's what they... That's what to the, the body actually does when you have inflammation. It creates a lot of fatigue. You kind of repair. I guess it's sort of a natural thing. You want to stop and not do anything and let your body heal. Uh, like animals, go lay down until they get better. So you exactly. talk about you, you talk about you know the the warning signs. How how do people know if they're just like a normal tired or if they have something more severe kind of fatigue? Like what are the warning signs? Well, I think. Certainly, we're seeing, even in a younger and younger and younger patient population, uh, brain fog. And I think if you had asked me about brain fog 20 years ago when I first started this area, uh, this was a common complaint in 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds. But now we see it in 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds. Millennials come in with, you know, complaining of brain fog and malaise. And it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting old, but you know, I, th I thought it was just 30. I, you know, I just don't have my get up and go that I used to have. And this is a warning sign. We're not supposed to have that. We're not supposed to have to be powered 
by uh, double espressos three times a day and 12 Red Bulls to get through the day. And I think part of the problem is we've, we've thought that our modern lifestyle, uh, particularly social media, we see everybody happy, 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 doing everything wonderfully. And, and we somehow go, oh my gosh, that's what I should be like too. And we have to power through our day or I'm a mom with two young kids and you know, I've got to be there to get them to their 27 events every day. And that's normal to be, you know, fatigued, to be not knowing what to do, but it's not normal. And surveys actually show that at least 50% of the population is fatigued or tired at any particular time. And we've accepted that as normal. And it's absolutely not normal. No, for sure. You know, in the book, you talk about the the seven deadly energy disruptors. Um, and, and as a functional medicine doctor, I, I, I noticed a few missing, but we can talk about those. But uh, I mean, things that I see regularly in my practice, but these are really a great starting list. So tell us about these seven deadly energy disruptors. Yeah, you know, I had seven uh, disruptors in uh, in the Plant Paradox book, and I've I've tweak that list in terms of energy because I, I think there's some real mm -hmm. mischief makers that deserve our attention. And for, first of all, antibiotics. Uh, we still not only overuse antibiotics to treat things that have no business being treated with antibiotics, such as viral illnesses. We still, unfortunately, practitioners, anytime someone comes in with a sore throat or a cough, the the gut sense is to give them broad spectrum antibiotics. And what none of us realized uh, until recently is that broad spectrum antibiotics kill off not only a bug that we thought we were gonna kill, but also our entire gut microbiome. And it may actually take two years to reestablish an entire healthy microbiome after a single round of antibiotics. Uh, we had no idea of this dense tropical rainforest that we had in our gut that drove so much of our energy. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Plus, the antibiotics, as you and I know, are in the, our food supply, uh, particularly in animals from factory farms. Uh, it is still legal for veterinarians to dose entire flocks of chickens or entire herds of animals with the claim that they're treating one sick animal. And still, as long as the veterinarian says that they need it, they still legally can do it. And, yeah. and as you and I know, some of these organic or natural chickens have been tested for antibiotics from certain farms, and they may have a 60% antibiotic pickup rate in wow. normal natural chickens that aren't supposed to get any antibiotics. So really, I didn't know that. That's frightening. <laughs> yeah, it is actually really frightening. Yeah. Is, it, that because, it, is that because they use them anyway? If one animal's sick, they give it to everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was the, that was the, there's always loopholes as you and I unfortunately mm -hmm. have learned in laws. And the loophole was if the veterinarian thinks there's a sick chicken and there's a, flock of 100,000 chickens in a warehouse, uh, then he is allowed to treat the entire flock to treat that one sick chicken. And the vet, there's great vets and great doctors, and there's bad vets and bad doctors. If the vet is on the payroll of the big corporation, you see where I'm going. Absolutely. So what are the other seven the six disruptors. So I think glyphosate has rapidly rose to kind of my number two mischief maker of all time. Mm -hmm. It is it is a it's an antibiotic against the earth, in my opinion. Uh, it was actually patented by Monsanto as an antibiotic initially. And what yeah. what we didn't know, what you and I didn't know, is that. Yes, it works with this crazy, it works against the shikimate pathway, how plants make protein synthesis. And Monsanto said, don't worry, humans don't use this shikimate pathway, so you're safe, it can't hurt you. 
What they didn't bother to tell us was that bacteria and fungi use the shikimate pathway so that when you swallow glyphosate, uh, it actually kills off your microbiome rather effectively. Plus, recent evidence is that it in itself, without any other effect, is a gut wall disruptor. It breaks tight junctions. And in one paper, uh, I show that glyphosate actually interferes with mitochondrial function. And that's actually not too hard to believe because mitochondria, as your listeners know, are actually engulfed ancient bacteria and they actually carry a bacteria signature, and they work as a functioning bacteria within all of our cells. So it's actually was not surprising uh, as I was researching this to find out that in fact, glyphosate affects mitochondrial function. Yeah. So it's, uh, and it's everywhere. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's on 70% of our agricultural crops. It's the most abundant agrochemical in use today. It's on over 90% of our corn, soy, and, and, um, and, and uh, <laughs> cotton. It's kind of scary. It's out there. It's, and it's um, really being looked at from the legal point of view. There's over 14,000 lawsuits pending against the herbicide. Uh, and I think and that's for its human human effect. But I think what you're speaking to is something really more important, which is its effects on the microbiome of the soil and also the microbiome of humans. And, and they're interconnected. And I think we we literally are are destroying the microbiome of the soil, which fills the organic matter and leads to uh, increased greenhouse gas emissions from loss of soil carbon. And then you've got the microbiome effects on humans, which has all the consequences that you just talked about. Yeah, you know, you're right. You know, we, we talk about you are what you eat, but you are what the things you're eating ate. Well, the same thing is true with plants. And plants, as you and I know, have this incredible rich soil microbiome that would normally assist in feeding the plant and allowing the plant to absorb nutrients. And now, because of glyphosate and, and other biocides, our soil is dead. And so we can we could have a plant that looks like bok choy or spinach, uh, but it does not have the nutrients that it used to have. In fact, our our soil is so depleted of the common nutrients that we need, like magnesium, for instance, um, th that we don't have a chance. No, it's it's huge. I mean, and the data on glyphosate is people don't understand. Oh, it's just Roundup is used on Roundup Ready soybeans. It's not. It's used on seventy percent of crops, and it's two hundred twenty million pounds a year. It's used in the United States. I think since nineteen seventy four, it's one point six billion kilograms have been used on crops in the United States alone, and it, it's uh, it's on seventy different food crops, including corn, soy, canola. Uh, if you have a, a slice of bread, a bowl of Cheerios, a sushi roll, a plate of pasta, a slice of pizza, a chicken nugget, it's probably got Roundup on it. <laughs> uh, and it, it just, you know, it's scary when you look at the work from the Environmental Working Group. Your Cheerios has more glyphosate per serving than vitamin D or B12, which actually have to be added to the cereal to enrich it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a big problem. And I, I think you're right. This understanding of its role in the microbiome is really quite important. So uh, it, you've got antibiotics, glyphosate, and there's more chemicals that are a problem, right? Yeah, I mean, we've, we're surrounded with environmental toxins. Uh, you know, one of the favorite old ones was BPA in plastics, and uh, most of BPA has now been banned, but BPS looks to be even more mischievous than BPA. And these, these are endocrine disruptors, they're hormone yeah. disruptors. And one of the things people should realize is that uh, estrogen, for instance, uh, is one of the best fat storage hormones that's ever been invented. As uh, any uh, young woman um, uh, in her teenage years knows that estrogen is designed to make you store fat. And we now have chemicals that mimic estrogen. And we're awash in these things. Uh, for instance, mm. Phthalates, another very important plasticizer, is present in our food wraps, any plastic mm. food wrap. So you may get your organic uh, pastured chicken breast, and if it comes in a shrink wrap plastic, you'll actually pick up 
phthalates off of that plastic. And one of the really scary things is that there's really scary correlation between uh, boys' penis sizes and the amount of chicken their mother ate during pregnancy. And it's a inverse relationship. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you mentioned environmental chemicals, and the couples that you haven't mentioned, these are the these are the uh, sort of we call persistent organic pollutants that are really petrochemical driven from you know oil derivative things, plastics, and so forth. But there's another class which is heavy metals, and for me, that was the massive driver of fatigue, and for many patients, so mercury, lead are the two biggest. And uh, how do you how do you think about those? That's a great question. Um, I look at mercury and lead and cadmium in a great number of my patients. I can tell you that the vast majority of people with high mercury levels in my practice are dentists and sushi eaters. Dentists for obvious reasons, sushi re eaters hopefully for obvious reasons. But one mercury thing, in this picture. Yeah, mercury. Uh, one of the interesting things that at least I see is that heavy metals in general are uh, contained in, in our fat cells. And it's like a tuna uh, maybe in, have toxic levels of mercury, but that tuna is doing perfectly fine because the heavy metals are actually in the fat. It's when people have weight loss that we release those heavy metals from fat. And this was actually demonstrated by Ray Walford in Biosphere 2. Um, you and I are probably old enough to remember Biosphere 2, the experiment in the Arizona desert where they locked everybody in a geodesic dome for a year to stimulate, simulate a mission on Mars. And everybody had to grow their own food and produce their own food. And long story short, it was a horrible failure. People lost about 30% of their weight in six months. And one of the findings was that heavy metals and organopesticides went up precipitously, very rapidly, and stayed elevated for over a year uh, before they went down. And it was because those heavy metals were there in these participants' fat cells. And we, as you know, have a horrible system for detoxifying heavy metals. Our liver does a horrible job of it. And they're excreted by our liver into our bile, thinking that we'll get rid of it through our stool, except we're really good at absorbing heavy metals out of our gut. So we actually set up a vicious cycle. So we excrete it and then pick it up. And as I talk about in the book, anyone who's actually on a weight loss program really should be supplementing with chlorella and activated charcoal during that time period because they will complex with heavy metals. And uh, knock on wood, we, we've been very effective with those two treatments in bringing down people's heavy metals without the need for chelation. Um, yeah. I mean, chelation is a bigger term, but it's basically there's ways to upregulate your body's detox system and reduce the um, sure. inputs. And I think uh, it's so key. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do. And introducing you all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter and I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger, longer. Now back to this week's episode. And you also mentioned drugs that disrupt your energy. Yeah, you know, the big driver that uh, I saw in mm. the plant paradox was NSAIDs, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories. Uh, these drugs are actually one of the best ways to create leaky gut that anybody ever came up with. And this was known about by the drug companies when they were introduced in the 1970s. In fact, it was so well known that by law, you couldn't take these drugs for over two weeks 
period of time because they were so dangerous with that effect. Now, of course, we eat them like candy. And so anytime we produce leaky gut, we produce inflammation. And that inflammation in turn actually produces more pain. And if you have more pain, you'll take more of these drugs and the cycle continues. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I really urge people to do is get these seemingly harmless NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, out of their uh, medicine cabinets. The yeah. second group in the same same box yeah. are the PPIs, yeah. the proton pump inhibitors. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, to take people back to high school biology class, um, we actually make energy in mitochondria by pumping protons uh, across the uh, mitochondrial membranes. When proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, like Prilosec, like Protonix came out, they were a miracle in terms of the treatment of ulcers because we had something to stop stomach acid production. But like any good idea, when we then make them easy to obtain for the treatment of heartburn, what we didn't know was that these things were not specific for the proton pumps in the stomach. They affect all proton pumps. And proton pumps are what drive mitochondrial function. And when we poison the mitochondria in our heart and specifically poison the mitochondria in our brain with proton pump inhibitors, it's no wonder that congestive heart failure strongly correlates with proton pump inhibitors. Yeah. Dementia strongly correlates with proton pump inhibitors all for the sake of relieving heartburn. Uh, yeah. So if you want to poison mitochondria, take a proton pump inhibitor. That's an interesting framework. And we know it inhibits absorption of nutrients and it can affect your GI function and cause irritable bowel and leaky gut, all kinds of problems. But uh, the mitochondrial story is an interesting one that hasn't really been told. And I think, uh, you know, it all comes down to mitochondria, which is really what we're talking about in terms of energy, right? All these things affect the mitochondria which are these little energy factories that take food and oxygen and burn them in your cells to produce energy. And all the things you're talking about will have adverse effects, all those chemicals, not only by affecting your microbiome, but also just directly affects on the mitochondria. And the key to really figuring out your energy is healing your mitochondria. And I think some of the shocking data about the microbiome, and I'd love if you could sort of draw this connection a little more, is how the microbiome affects the mitochondria. It's really with the subject of your book. But I'd love you to sort of maybe tease that out a little bit. It's really all about how does the, the damage to the microbiome and the adverse metabolic gut compounds influence everything, including hormones or appetite, mood, brain function, weight, energy. But, and, but start with the mitochondria because the, the idea is that the gut has all these bacteria and they get out of balance and then that stuff happens. So, and what happens? So, again, Mitochondria are ancient engulfed bacteria, and they actually talk to their sisters, the gut microbiome, which for the most part are bacteria as well. In fact, we inherit our mitochondria from our mother. Uh, our dad doesn't give us any. And we inherit, if things work out okay, our initial microbiome from our mother uh, via birth and also by being breastfed. Believe it or not, one of the huge benefits of breastfeeding is that uh, a woman's breast milk has huge amounts of bacteria and fungi uh, that are also populating the baby. Okay, so uh, years ago, uh, one of my first times presenting at the World Congress of Microbiota in Paris, I met the director, uh, Marvin Endres, and he and I were talking. I had a paper on, and he says, you know, I'm going to tell you something. He said, the microbiome talks to the mitochondria. And my eyes went up, and I said, well, how do they do that? And he says, well, we don't know yet, but I'm telling you, we're going to find out that the microbiome talks to the mitochondria because they're literally sisters. And I said, well, hey, you know, that's interesting. And he says, yeah, they send text messages. Well, lo and behold, uh, Marvin was right because the 
the language, what's called the trans-kingdom communication system of how the microbiome talks to mitochondria and to our DNA was discovered. And it's, it's as big a discovery as the Enigma code discovery in World War II, the German code. So what that discovery was is the discovery of postbiotics. And postbiotics, uh, everybody knows probiotics, friendly bacteria. Most people are learning prebiotics, which are the fibers that friendly bacteria need to eat. But when those bacteria eat those fibers, they produce either short chain fatty acids like acetate and butyrate, but more importantly, they produce gases and they're called gasomessengers or gasotransmitters. And it's these messaging system that's now been discovered that actually talks, actually tells mitochondria what to do, whether to make more energy when things are good or whether to throttle back because things are bad down in the engine room. And it's, it, you know, the, the whole discovery is, is like, yeah. holy cow, we are this incredible symbiotic organism. I mean, for instance, the Nobel Prize for discovering how nitric oxide works and where it came from, uh, you know, was awarded in 1998. And, uh, you know, for years in cardiac surgery and cardiology, we knew what nitric, nitric oxide did, but we didn't know how it did it. But nitric oxide is a gas or messenger. But here's something really wild. So hydrogen gas is a gas or messenger. And part of the fermentation process of bacteria eating fiber is to produce hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is the world's smallest molecule, and it diffuses right across our gut wall. And one of the shocking things as I was researching this is if you look at patients with Parkinson's disease, they have a microbiome that does not make hydrogen gas, whereas people who don't have Parkinson's disease have a microbiome that produces hydrogen gas. And you can give patients with Parkinson's disease, hydrogen water, and that's yeah. the water that has hydrogen dissolved in it, and they will symptomally improve once wow. they consistently start taking hydrogen water. And so, as I joke in the book, uh, in, in Boy Scouts, what we used to do, uh, you know, we'd, we'd eat beans on the, on the camping trip, and we'd have big lighters, and we'd actually literally light our farts with this blue flame. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that happen at a campfire a couple of times. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's hydrogen gas. And little uh, did we know. So methane too, maybe. I don't know. Exactly. Well, it turns out <laughs> methane is actually a gas or messenger as well, mm -hmm. as well as hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell. And for years, you and I were taught that hydrogen sulfide is a toxic gas. But we now know that the effect of hydrogen sulfide is that of a hormetic agent. And a hormetic agent is basically that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So, yeah. that, so that no hydrogen sulfide is, is not good. A little hydrogen sulfide is good. Yeah. A lot of hydrogen sulfide will kill you. So mm -hmm. a little dab will do you of these things. And mm -hmm. so getting back to your original question, the more we feed our microbiome, the foods that they can make these literally text messages that tell your mitochondria to produce energy, the better off we are. And again, you, you look at, oh, a, a tribe like the Hansas, who they eat oh, about 165 uh, grams of fiber a day, if we're lucky, the average American may eat 20, probably not, but they're a what? Eight, I think it's eight is the average American. Yeah, that's I think five if we're or lucky, <laughs> if we're lucky. And half of the fiber we eat is actually insoluble fiber, which is actually really bad for you in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, so the long story short, we are so deprived of the energy producing compounds that are available to all of us. 
if we'll just feed the microbiome what they need. And that's that's a big part of the book. The, uh, the energy. So, so a lot of the key is fixing your gut to get your energy back. Yeah. The second key uh, is we are overfed and underpowered. And mm -hmm. what, what the heck does that mean? Um, we, in general, Americans eat nearly 16 hours a day, almost continuously from sunup until well after sundown. And we have what's called mitochondrial rush hour, which uh, living in, in LA is, is easy to understand, but uh, simplistically, our mitochondria can handle sugars, fats, and proteins. And we use a slightly different system for making energy from sugar, from fat, and from protein. And in the good old days, when we ate whole food, like you advocate and I advocate, these different components, sugars would arrive first in the mitochondria. They'd be followed by protein sometimes later. And a long time later, they'd be followed by fats. And mitochondria have, if you will, basically a freeway, an energy producing freeway. Now, when these things arrive, in a staggered fashion, the freeway moves great. But what happens is with our modern diet, with processed foods, with ultra processed foods, we have combined simple sugars, simple proteins, and easily absorbed fats that hit our mitochondria simultaneously. And the mitochondria actually can't handle all these. So we actually have stagnation in the energy producing highways. And we have systems on freeways. Okay, we're going to have traffic lights that's going to control the on, you know, onslaught of all this. But we get mitochondrial gridlock. And I use the example. So, okay, let's have breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, you're slamming with all three of these components. And your mitochondria literally go into gridlock for two or three hours. You begin to get sleepy at 10 o'clock and you say, oh, I need a little pick me up. I'll have, um, you know, I'll, I'll have a donut and a cup of coffee. And once again, traffic gets slammed. By that time, it's lunch. We slam it again. And so this process of gridlock really never, un never stops until we go to sleep. And even after we go to sleep, there's still two to three hours of backup, if you will, on the mitochondrial freeways. So our mitochondria really never have a chance. And I, the, in researching this book and trying this out on my patients, one of the things that was dramatic was that if I could lessen the period of time that you're asking mitochondria to handle food, the better off you're going to be because they have a chance to recover and heal themselves, if you will. And that gets into part two of the book. How do you put this into practice? So, so your, your book is quite extensive and, and, and it really goes into detail about a lot of these uh, unusual compounds that come from a disturbed gut microbiome that have broad spectrum challenges in the body. And this is what we've been doing in functional medicine for decades. It's really the foundation of my practice. It's really the key to getting people healthy. And I sort of agree with you that a lot of the uh, beginning and the end of health starts in the gut. And, and it's really always the first place we start with food and gut repair in functional medicine. Uh, but you talk about, you know, the plan of how do you do this? What are the do's and don'ts of the energy paradox when it comes to eating? Well, first of all, the more, and you and I, I think, would agree complete with this, the more you stay away from processed foods, from ultra-processed foods, that's really the fundamental starting point. The more you actually use whole foods and literally foods in their whole state, the better off you're going to be. Number two, I, I can't resist telling people to get lectin-containing foods out of their diet. Uh, lectins are part of the plant uh, defense system against being eaten or having their seeds being eaten. And these are proteins that uh, Dr. Fasano and others have shown uh, disrupt the gut wall. And they in themselves are antigens that 
in my original line of work, heart, heart disease attract uh, inflammation to the wall of blood vessels. And so um, they're a nasty bunch of compounds and they're in so many of our favorite foods, uh, such as whole grains. Uh, the nice thing about beans is beans are loaded with lectins, but pressure cooking and soaking beans and fermenting beans actually uh, eliminates the lectin problem. So there's Would so pressure cooking grains do the same thing. Great question. Uh, it will pressure cooking will not break the gluten in uh, wheat, barley, or rye. Uh, gluten resists pressure cooking. There is a gluten-like protein in oats that also resists pressure cooking. And I can't tell you the number of people who have gone on a gluten-free diet with autoimmune diseases with celiac who are not cured. They still have celiac because the foods that they're eating, like oats, like corn, are loaded with lectins. And just recently, I had a gentleman who we, I don't like to use the word cured of rheumatoid arthritis, but his markers uh, vanish by following our program. And then he was a snowbird and he came back uh, this winter and his rheumatoid, one of his uh, RA markers was, was elevated for the first time in like four years. And I said, uh, you've been cheating. He said, no, no, no. Are you kidding? I, I wouldn't do that. And I said, well, something's getting into your diet. I said, well, what do you have for breakfast? He says, oh, glad you asked. I've been on a pressure cooked oatmeal cook, kick. Every morning I have a bowl of pressure cooked oats. And I said, wait a minute, you can't do that. It's on your list. You can't pressure cook oats. And you would know, pull out the list. He said, oh, oh no, that's, that's the change. And so we took it out. A month later, his RA was back to normal. Yeah, absolutely. So, I see so that so often. Yeah, yeah, I see that so often. So, um, so getting out lectins, eating whole foods, um, any other any other sort of key dietary do's and don'ts? Um, yeah, so one of the, I think the shocking benefit uh, of time controlled eating, and that is limiting the amount of time during the day that you consume food is probably one of the number one fixes in our current energy crisis. And it mm. seems almost uh, contradictory, uh, paradoxical, if you will, mm. that mm. you, the more you kind of snack throughout the day, the actual harder it is for your mitochondria to make energy. And yeah. the more you limit- You have to eat to get energy, but what you're saying <laughs> is if you stop eating, you actually are better at, at the end of the day, making more energy. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I'll give you an example. We're actually supposed to have significant downtime for repair work, for repair work for our brains, repair work for our mitochondria. And that would normally have happened because we were sunlight creatures and we were controlled by sun. And we get up when the sun came out and we basically go to bed when the sun went down. And even the advent of fire 150,000 years ago, we were still exposed to orange light, and red light, and we certainly weren't exposed to blue light. So we still had a limited period of eating. And the evidence is if, if we have a 12 hour window of no eating, which is really easy if you think about it, that's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., that's a 12 hour eating window, and you'd have from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. of not eating we begin to shift into mitochondrial repair. And what's really exciting is the more you go beyond 12 hours, the better the repair work goes. Uh, let me give you an example. There's not a lot of repair work done on LA freeways during the day because the traffic is so bad. Uh, I drive into LA very early in the morning or to Palm Springs very early in the morning from Santa Barbara. And that's when the repair work's going on because there is much traffic on the road. Well, our mitochondria do the same thing. If they're doing work, they have no time to repair. And it's the repair of mitochondria, undoing the damage of our eating, that actually allows mitochondria to get back to full power. 
So the more we can limit the time period that people eat, the better. Now, the first thing we don't want to have people do is, okay, what Dr. Gundry says tomorrow morning, my first break fast is going to be at noon. I'm going to hold off break fast until noon. And I can tell you that 80% of your listeners and my listeners will fall flat on their faces because 80% of Americans are insulin resistant. And with insulin resistance, that's in the book too, you can't use free fatty acids, fat as a fuel. You can't, you can't get to them. And so you got to build up slowly in tolerance. And we have a six week program of holding people by the hand and changing when they eat breakfast one hour at a time so that we're going to stepwise because people fall flat on their faces with attempting intermittent fasting um, because they don't have the availability to mitochondrial flexibility of changing fat uh, metabolism. So you talk about a lot of other things that are really uh, important parts of using energy, including exercise, hacking, uh, sun exposure, uh, avoiding blue light, which ruins our circadian rhythms, uh, and even getting a dog. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about those things before we have to wrap up the podcast? Yeah, uh, you know, I mentioned that blue light uh, from our devices, from our lights, uh, we are constantly being exposed to blue light. And blue light is really detrimental to almost all of our functioning, including our mitochondria. And it really, um, we are awash in uh, what I call junk light. And I think one of the most important things people can do is two things. Uh, be exposed to red light at sunrise or sunset. If you're going to take walks, that's the time to do it. If you can't get exposed to red light, get yourself a red light box. There's a number of red light and near infrared light makers. I, I particularly use a Juve device, but there's plenty of other ones and expose yeah. yourself to red light. Interesting, one of the things I learned, which I found hard to believe, but we actually produce ATP from melanin exposure from natural sunlight. And wow. so we do photosynthesis exactly like a plant. And it may be why fundamentally we want to be outdoors. We want to be at the beach. We want to be exposed to sunlight. And it may be that we're far more attuned to what sunlight is actually doing for us at a basic level than we thought. Plus, yeah. there's really cool evidence that sunlight actually activates mitochondria. Um, and it changes the way water moves in mitochondria, but that's a whole nother subject. And uh, so why get a dog? Two reasons. I'm a big fan in the book of exercise snacking. And there's really good evidence that walking upstairs for a minute may, up and downstairs for a minute, may have the same effect on your mitochondrial function through the production of myokines from our muscle cells as 20, 30 minutes of walking on a treadmill. And wow. the, the effect of five minutes is even more. So why get a dog? Dogs are gonna have to go out at least twice a day. And dogs will take you uh, for a walk. The other thing about dogs is the evidence is overwhelming that people who have dogs have a much healthier and diverse microbiome than people oh, who don't have that. dogs because the dog get licked in the face. <laughs> bring, yeah, lick your let your dog lick your face and they bring in all these amazing dirt microbes into your house that you will mix with. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. Would you please tell people why breakfast is not the most important meal of the day? Uh, well, so I found, at least for myself, and I assume I'm an average person, 